everyone. We have with us uh, Pascal Matisse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Close enough, yeah. laughs> uh, he's an assistant professor in computer vision at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, before this, he received his PhD and postdoc, both also at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he was also a visiting researcher here at Columbia uh, with Shifu Chang in 2016. And he's also visited the University of Tübingen um, under Professor uh, Zeynep Akata. Uh, his research focuses on discovering and embedding prior knowledge in deep networks for visual understanding. Um, so today he's going to talk to us about hyperbolic and hyperspherical visual understanding. So uh, let's see. We're yeah. curious to hear from you. <laughs> uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about today about uh, computer vision, about deep learning, and specifically how do we design deep networks uh, when you have prior knowledge. So here we have a very classical supervised learning setup. Right? We have an image coming in, goes to a network, and we attach a label. In this case, we want to predict who, pa who painted this painting. From a knowledge perspective, however, all the knowledge is in an individual label that's assigned to an example. Right. And sure, if we have millions of examples, we can get pretty far. But it's a quite limiting perspective to, to deep learning. Because there's so much more knowledge. Uh, 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 Pascal, sorry to interrupt. I think the Zoom slides are not adjusting or not changing. Oh, oh, wait, then I'll know what to do. Then maybe I'll just share my entire second screen. I think that might. Uh, yeah, the, 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 but I think then if I do this, then you will not see it. They will not see it anymore. What, what do you see now, Carl? Yeah, now I see the slides. Yeah, yeah. And it changes? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Then we go. Continue. Right, but there's so much more knowledge out there in terms of data sets and categorization. Think about ImageNet. So this is an old poster of ImageNet. The way it was constructed, it was not meant to be one versus rest. It was not meant to be one of vectors. Right? There's a Yorkshire Terrier and a Bulldog and an airplane. Right? These three are not equally far away from each other semantically. Well, in the image domain, that's already quite hierarchical. In the video domain, it's much, it goes in extra dimensions. There's not only semantic hierarchies, but also temporal hierarchies that are formed. And if we go beyond vision, really in general for deep learning, there are many fields where we have centuries of ontologies being constructed and ready in, 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 uh, in books the structure of DNA, etc. It goes on, right? And we, what we want is a fundamental way of, of in, uh, incorporating this in deep learning. So we don't, we're not looking for ad hoc solutions for a specific problem. We really want to make, let's say, the, the general design of deep networks uh, enable them to, to learn from this hierarchical or general inductive knowledge about categorization. So in light of that, I want to talk about three papers. I, I chose these three. Um, the first two are hyperbolic uh, geometry for computer vision in the presence of semantic hierarchies. And the third is a preprint that we put in archive last week, uh, which I, I'm very excited about. So I, I wanted to share it with you, uh, where we talk about the geometry of, of deep learning when you have no prior knowledge. Right? So we always use one hot factors and softmax. Is there anything better that we can do? And I think there is. And it only costs one line of code. But I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, I want to start with, with hierarchies, because that's the starting point of all this hyperbolic stuff. Uh, because why do we even care about hyperbolic space? And it all starts with hierarchies. So the ma main property of a hierarchy, typically, typically a semantic hierarchy of, of categories, is that they grow exponentially as a function of depth. Right? One root node, two nodes, four nodes, eight nodes, something like that. Now I want to embed this hierarchy in a space, right? Because in deep learning, I care about doing optimization. So I need them to, all these nodes to be a point in a space. There is a problem. So I can start with the root node at the origin and then move outwards. But the problem of Euclidean space is that it grows linearly as a function of the norm. So what happens is if I start embedding a hierarchy, the deeper the hierarchy goes, the more the, the leaf nodes get together. Well, the leaf nodes are the ones that we actually care about, right? Those are typically the, the final categories. And you could say, in theory, I can combat this with an exponential growth in dimensions or an exponential far away, but even in practice, it doesn't work. So what we want is an alternative geometry that actually matches this nature of, 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 of trees, this exponential growth. And that's where hyperbolic spaces come into deep learning. Uh, so I'm going to use a couple of slides to talk about 
what even is hyperbolic space and where does it come from? So it dates back to the 18th, 19th century when mathematicians were in love with Euclid's uh, elements. They thought it was the best thing ever. Right? And there were some definitions, some postulates, and from that you could derive a whole book of theorems. A beautiful deductive system. And they loved every part of it except the fifth postulate. And I, I visualize it here. So if I have these two lines, that, that's across one other line, and this alpha and beta, if that's less than 180 degrees, then surely at some point, these two lines cross exactly once. Now, and compared to the other four, this was a very long postulate. And mathematicians hated it because they thought it's a th it should be a theorem. They didn't like it as a, as a, as a starting point. Uh, so they really said, do we really, really need it? And they tried uh, a couple of, uh, of decades of disproving it, of making it into a theorem, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, until they thought, oh, let's, let's get to our most powerful tool in mathematics, which is approved by, by contradiction, right? There's no more powerful tool than that. Let's see what happens. So they, they changed the fifth postulate to say, what if we can now, we never intersect or we intersect many times. Uh, so rather than disproving this whole system, uh, they came up with a completely alternative system that still works. And that's where hyperbolic space is, is one of these. Outcomes. So I, I, I mentioned here three names that are commonly mentioned with this. So uh, at some point, this guy came, uh, came across and he said, I found this, this great new alternative geometry. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy about it. And then uh, Gauss said, well, that's very nice. I came with that 30 years ago. Uh, but I was afraid to tell it because I was afraid to, to, what, to, to see what, what other mathematicians would say. Uh, sorry, I think it's typical guy that he already, yeah, he found it out a couple of uh, decades ago, but yeah, he thought I'll leave it because I don't know what it means. And later we found out that uh, Lobachevsky also from Russia had, had a similar thought, a similar outcome, but it was all in Russian. So we didn't know until uh, much later. But these, there are many more people, of course, uh, Riemann came later to, let's say, generalize this whole thing. And there were many other people, but I think these three are uh, well-known names in this. So that's the origin. And now, in the last 200 years, what we've been playing around with, this is the, all the stuff you, you, you get taught in high school, right? Uh, two pi squared, all these line, straight lines, etc. And by then, you have also curved spaces. So spherical spaces, a positively curved space, and hyperbolic is negatively curved space. And specifically, there are some properties that we care about in deep learning, right? It, it goes much further. So I'm, I'm putting some equations here that don't really matter. There are some few points that are important. So the hyperbolic geometry itself is just an axiomatic system. You can't do anything with it, right? And we care about numbers. We care about doing linear algebra in this kind of spaces. So for that, we need a model. So there are a couple of models out there. I'm, I'm pointing out one because that's the one we, we commonly use, which is the Poincaré ball model, which is basically you're inside the ball. So no longer space is infinite, but you're inside the ball. And at the boundary of the ball, Hyperbolic distances are infinite. Uh, and then basic properties like addition, et cetera, they all need to be changed. So you have what is no longer, you have no longer a vector space like in, in Euclidean space, but it's called a gyro vector space. So there are all sorts of things change. Distances are now these geodesics, curved, as you can see. But there's one main property that I think is really vital here is that as a function of the origin, so as a function of the distance to the origin, the distance grows exponentially which is the very main point we wanted to solve in the first place. So hyperbolic geometry goes much further, right? There's, if you talk to a physicist about it, he talk, will talk about relativity. There are all sorts of angles. For us specifically, we care about uh, doing linear algebra in this kind of space, in a space where distances grow exponentially because we want to work at higher things. So that's the, the, the four slide overview of hyperbolic space for deep learning. And with that, I want to talk about the first paper. Uh, so there were some papers that embedded hierarchies on hyperbolic space, which works much better for just embedding them themselves. But we in computer vision care about downstream tasks, like recognizing actions, recognizing objects. So the first thing we thought was, how useful are these, these hierarchical embeddings in hyperbolic space for the computer vision task? And we, we chose action recognition because it was quite frank that in these action data sets, the hierarchies are just available on the data sets. People give them, they, they say, this is how it's constructed, but they're just gathering dust, not doing anything with them. So we thought it was quite a waste. So we thought, okay, we're going to see whether hierarchies and hyperbolic space do anything positive for actions. So what we did was the following. So we basically, we tried to make a shared space where both action hierarchies and videos 
uh, are that we and we can compute distances between them. So we start with action hierarchies. So we assume they are known, right? There's one hierarchy, we know it, and it's fixed. Um, and what we do is we say, well, each node in this hierarchy becomes a point in hyperbolic space. Uh, and we took this loss from one of these hyperbolic embedding papers, the Poincaré embedding. Basically, what they do is you randomly distribute points initially and just start pooling and pushing points away based on whether they are parent-child connections or not. And then hopefully what you end up with is a distribute, uh, distribution of points such that the distance between these two points in that space reflects the hierarchical similarity, right? The closer the distance to the higher similarity. We added an extra loss because we want, still want these nodes to be a bit farther away, right? The, that original paper didn't care about the downstream task of recognition, so we had to do some extra loss just to uh, make our life easier. Okay, and then we say we keep that fixed. We don't touch them, they're optimized once without looking at any video, and we keep those fixed. What we're going to optimize is the second part. So we have a video, feed it through the 3D CNN, choose your favorites, doesn't really matter. And you end up with one representation for the video. Well, that representation is in Euclidean space. So we need to do what's called an exponential mapping. So broadly, it's a mapping from a, from a tangent space to a manifold, well, in this case, from our re Euclidean representation to our hyperbolic uh, space where the actions are. Um, and then you run. So typically we make the last few layers uh, learnable and the rest is just pre-trained. And what we end up with is a space where both actions and videos are points, right? And the actions, we keep them fixed because they abide to a nice hierarchy. And we make sure that the, the videos move towards the correct class. So this is just a soft, standard softmax loss that says, make sure the distance from my video to the corresponding action is zero. And the question? Yeah. So in this loss, we choose like the, the lowest hierarchy to move towards or? Yeah, so we always, so we, we consider the internal nodes not as, as targets. Yeah. So we only consider the, the leaf nodes, but we use the internal nodes in this part. Yeah, so we put, here we use the internal nodes to make sure that all the leaf nodes and internal nodes are distributed correctly, but afterwards we don't explicitly look at them. There are some yeah. tasks where it's, we still do so, but I'll, I'll come back to that. But for the, for the optimization, this part of the optimization, we only care about the leaf nodes. Now the question is, oh, sorry. Um, this may not be a question that makes sense, but is there some intuition for um, what dimensional Euclidean space you can approximate something from hyperbolic space of some number of dimensions in like a Johnson Lynn stress flavory. Well, it, it, it's always approximate. So the, right. the, in the beginning of the hyperbolic space, it's very close to what you did. Rather than doing operations and layers in hyperbolic space, they said, well, that's annoying. Mm -hmm. We actually project to Euclidean space, do operations then, yeah. there, and then go back. Yeah. But it's always an approximation. Mm -hmm. And the, the bigger the difference is, the cruder the approximation. So right. you can do it. But it's not recommended, and it last. Let's say since last year, between now, we really have now have theory on how to really make everything hyperbolic, yeah, hyperbolic. and stay in hyperbolic space. Because what you said, it, it's totally valid mm -hmm. numerically, but it doesn't make full use of the properties of hyperbolic space. Mm -hmm. And so the question here was, the, why do we care, right? So what 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 happens if we if we do so? So we did a number of experiments. So normally you do your one odd encoding where you need, in this case for this data set with 200 classes, you need 200 dimensions. Now they are just points in a space and I can, I'm free to choose how many dimensions. Uh, it turns out I can just do normal classification better, but especially uh, hierarchical consistency. I come back to your question about the, the internal nodes. We can also say now that we have a hierarchy, are the mistakes that I'm making also smaller? So if I'm incorrect, Am I still part of the same parent class or same uh, grandparent class? And that's the case. So that's where the, these internal nodes can come. Uh, we did some experiments with other geometries, uh, some other prototypes in other spaces. Uh, turns out uh, I did a hyperspherical one, which you shouldn't use anymore. Um, and also, especially zero shot seems to be quite a theme with hyperbolic space. I'll come back to that in the second paper. So if I have a hierarchy, and that hierarchy is very nicely embedded, and I train only on a few classes, I can generalize pretty well to the others because the hierarchy is nicely preserved. But uh, there's a second paper will show that even better. So one criticism at the time from a colleague was hierarchies, they're all kind of bullshit because yeah, I, if I learn with one of encoding, surely due to visual similarity, I'll recover the hierarchies. I don't, I don't need to give it. 
So we saw that as a challenge and we put it in the paper as well. So this is the average pairwise similarity for, for the test videos uh, in, with the standards, right? Euclidean la, uh, final layer and one of encoding and with ours. And they're partially right. You see some squares popping up on the left. There's some vague notion of, of hierarchical similarity, but there's also high similarity to non similar ones and sometimes very low to, you, to ones that are very close semantically. While if you enforce it the way we did it, you see it's a higher similarity to your class, and then you see all these sub squares popping up, which are all sub trees of this, of this network. So you really need to give it. If you, if you don't give it, yeah, you, you might learn some accidental ones, but it's not ideal. And here I have a few examples, right? Like I can search for videos. So if I start from the prototype action and look at the, dish, the most similar ones, I either get correct ones or I get ones that are very close. If I give it a video, it starts to battle between the hierarchy and what is in the video. So if I give it a very classical video, it's very easy to see the same thing popping up. Uh, but sometimes you see the second one is high kick, which was out of context. So high kicking in a, in a situation where normally other types of actions are being done. And there sometimes you see then it starts to battle where it says, actually, I look at the visual data and I see something else. And here, of course, if you have, this is archery, but it's actually not archery. It's someone pulling the arrows out of a board. That's the only thing in the video. And then it doesn't know what to do anymore and thinks it's doing uh, uh, do-it-yourself projects. Right, so the hierarchy can only help you so much if the video doesn't make any sense, the hierarchy cannot be covered. So we learned some lessons from that. So the starting point was these hierarchies are already available. They're free to use. And just embedding them as, as let's say, a starting point, a fixed point prototype in hyperbolic space, that just generally improves recognition and hierarchical consistency. And there are some nice zero shots uh, results out there. Okay, that, so we thought, okay, that's a nice starting point. What, what, what can we do now? So we did a few more papers. Uh, I'll highlight one that I was also presented last week. So for some, it might be old, but I'll, I like it anyway. So I'm just going to talk about it again. Uh, image segmentation. In its essence, image segmentation is just classification, but now per pixel. So surely we can do something similar again. All right. So, oh, and of course, in the semantic uh, image segmentation domain, it's the same thing where all these data sets from Pasco VOC to Coco stuff, it's already available, these hierarchies. That's how they're used, that's how these data sets are created. So we can, we want to use them. So what we did was now as follows, rather than making, the, really thinking about prototypes again, which is only one way of thinking. We also want to do the standard logistic regression like we all do in deep learning, but now in hyperbolic space. So for this paper, we went this route. So how does it work? Again, an image goes to a backbone, you choose your favorite deep lab, HRnet, UNet, whatever, and out of, uh, comes a per pixel representation. For each pixel, I have a representation. And normally what you do is you have your shared logistic regression over all pixels to classify each pixel with respect to a class. Now, rather than doing that, we move every pixel representation to hyperbolic space with the exponential map. And then what we do is we try to do logistic regression in hyperbolic space with the hierarchies now uh, as, a, as a constraint on the softmax. So we do a hierarchical softmax, which is uh, quite common in Euclidean space as well. But now we do it in hyperbolic space. So rather than doing a softmax over all classes simultaneously, you do it over all these, these subtrees. Um, well, there, was, there are hyperbolic logistic regression uh, implementations out there. Uh, yeah, but they only work globally. So if I give it the whole image and then do a, do a classification on the whole image, it works. But now I have a, a classification per pixel. Uh, turns out that one of these standards, the, these building blocks, they require uh, operating over 4D tensor, so width times height times number of channels times number of classes, which for five images requires roughly two, uh, 132 gigabytes. Now we're at the universities, so we don't have these nice uh, big GPUs. Uh, which, and also we don't want that. That doesn't make any sense. And it turns out this Mobi edition, you can refactor it into two 3D tensors, which is much more doable than this huge uh, clumsy tensor. So that's basically the, the technical contribution of the paper, which was uh, on the smaller side, just to, just to make it work at, at the pixel level. What was more interesting to me, and also I think very big in the paper is, what happens? What are the new things that are popped up? And the first thing is uh, uncertainty. So actually, I should go back to this picture. 
So we saw something interesting. I'm not sure if it's very visible to people here, but this is an image with three classes, person, sheep, and background. And we did the output space, we made those the 2D. So all the each pixel represents in 2D and also the logistic regression and hyperbolic space, these the gyro planes are in 2D. What you see is all these blobs are the gyro planes of individual classes. And then you see the, the dark green is like one class and then there's also like parent class around it. Uh, and then this is background, this is sheep, this is person. And what we expected was that all these black dots are individual pixel representations from that image. And what we ex expected were three blobs, right? One for person, one for sheep, one for background. Uh, but there was all sorts of things in the middle. Basically, there were almost like paths between the classes. And we, quite, we were quite puzzled and we thought that was noise or outliers. And it turns out to be quite the opposite. It turns out that all these pixels in the middle correspond to points in between classes. So all the ones at the boundary of, the, of this Poincaré ball, those are the ones we are very, we thought were very easy, like the middle of the, of the person in the middle of the sheep. And all the ones in the middle are actually on the boundary. In fact, so we can even on the right, I can even draw try, I can draw squares in this space. Like this is a, a red, red square, and these all correspond to the inside of an airplane. And I draw these a square here, and all these pixels correspond to the boundary. So there's quite a clear correlation going on. So we thought, okay, that's quite interesting. Uh, and we did some analysis on it. So th this is just this image. It's just a visualization of the norm of each pixel. So the darker the color, the, the, the lower the norm, the closer to the origin. And you can very clearly see that there are just object boundaries, some semantic boundaries pop up. I didn't even look at classes. I only look at the norm. And this is a recurring theme in hyperbolic space where this distance, uh, well, Carl, know, Carl knows a lot about this in the, also in the video domain, right? This distance to the origin says a lot about ambiguity and uncertainty. In the segmentation domain, that, that also, uh, also continues. So if you just do one pass, and directly you get nice semantic boundaries. Or you can do the same with Bayesian learning, right? So MC dropout during evaluation. And you get these very nice images on the right. It only requires many passes. So now you get this one. Well, we didn't do anything with the, with the paper, but I, it's very obvious that these has applications, for example, active learning or semi-supervised learning. So if I know which pixels are on the interior on, on the boundary, uh, I can use that to improve or, or speed up our training. Right? We did a lot of analysis to see do these, is there action, an actual correlation aggregated over the whole data set? And there's quite clearly a positive correlation between the, the norm of a pixel representation and distance to the boundary. And now the zero shots comes back again. So what we did was, oh, we trained a, a, net, a network on a, su a subset of classes and then evaluate on the, the others. That's technically zero label because you could have images where the object are, but then we don't optimize over them. So it's not zero shot, but zero label. Um, well, if you just do a one hot encoding in Euclidean space, like you always do, of course you get random performance because we don't know anything about the new classes. So if I change the normal softmax in Euclidean space with the hierarchical softmax, I already get some, right? So for example, here, this is about random and this, I get 16 uh, IOU for the new classes, even though I have never seen them. Well, it starts working, well, good for them. Uh, hyperbolic space is much better. And the reason is if we come back to these hierarchies in hyperbolic space, the hierarchies themselves are much better preserved in hyperbolic space. And if I want to generalize them to ones I haven't seen, I really need my hierarchy to still be very good. Otherwise, I can't generalize that one. And I see big jumps popping up just by changing the geometry that we, that we use. It's only the last layer. And here we see another thing coming back is that if I use very few dimensions, uh, hyperbolic space is preferred over Euclidean space. It's a much denser space to use. So what we learned, what we learned from this paper is that for image segmentation, hierarchies are at least as important. I personally think they're even more important because if you think about it, if I'm on the boundary between two classes, I actually look at an area around it, right? Because there's max pooling, etc. So I'm not always looking at one class and, and, or uh, let's say information from one class. I'm actually always looking at multiple classes in, in the bigger scope. So I think actually their hierarchies are more important. Now, you had to do some reformization of the, the basic, uh, basic operations, which uh, worked out well. And we see some initial success with uncertainty or ambiguity, generalizing to new classes. And working with few dimensions. So, actually, yeah. Uh, just a quick question. So, the one like on the slide before, yeah, 
uh, the at large these Quant variables that you put the at, so yeah. like visualize a PCA or something I mentioned, right? Like no, these are just the, you mean these ones? Yeah, the two D Quant variable. Then we use two dimensions as the output space. We don't do any dimensionality oh, reduction. Sure. Yeah, okay. sorry. But like, what does the distribution here at large tell, tell us about the underlying data distribution? Does it mean that the model is because like there's also for example the yellow plus I don't know what the yellow plus is, but a lot of yellow plus also occupies a lot of the center. So yeah. does it mean that the plus itself is like the model might be more yeah. You're having a perfect link to my next paper, okay. uh, but I, I'll, I'll I can answer this already now, which is that. This is what happens if you don't constrain your softmax. What happens is that pixels that are more dominant, more often occurring, they occupy a larger space because that's the, a nice way to get your loss down, right? So this is a bigger data set. So you see it's, it's, it's somewhat balanced. If I go back to all the way to the beginning, this is Pascal VOC. Now you see one class is not like the others, right? There's this huge backgrounds, which is much bigger than the other data sets. It's so big, the background class, that if I'm at the origin, where I just told you I don't, I don't know anything, I will still predict the backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So if you know nothing, then predict the background on Pascal fees. So that's, what, that's what you're saying, basically. So I have the hierarchy to constrain my softmax, but other than that, the loss determines everything. So how, where are they positioned? How big are they, et cetera? They are just a, uh, yeah, a result of your loss. Uh, so that, yeah, that's what I can say. Yeah. Um, so the uncertainty estimation of the that sort of boundary pixels it yeah. from classification boundaries, right? I, yeah, that, that's what I that's my hypothesis. Right, but if you do this in Euclidean space, you still have the same. Thing. Um, that's a very good point. I, I there's in Euclidean space, it's similar, it, but it's very uh, much like the zero shots. It's there, but more faint. Oh. Um, this <laughs> mapping from Euclidean to hyperbolic space for the Poincaré ball, ball model is nothing but a scaling. So the angles are preserved. So in a way, if I do it in Euclidean space, you see this relation as well, um, but it's weaker. I see. So we didn't do I didn't do the, the let's say the comparison here only so, for the zero shots. So like the transition has to go to the sort of the loop. I guess to the smaller the one and then. So um, I think it's more to do with how actually the leaves are distributed. Mm. Because this doesn't like these are actually still not that far. If you're here, then things are very far. But in Euclidean space with these hierarchies, there's not a natural way of necessarily yeah. because of this exponential growth. So it will still happen that if I'm at the origin, if I have this hierarchical constraint of the mm -hmm. softmax, that origin says something more about the root. I don't know anything. So this relation is still there, but I see. It's, it's weaker. So I guess what's 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 the advantage of uh, the hyperbolic loop? Like what, what, what's weaker? Like so sorry, uh, what, what do I mean with weaker is this this correlation. So it still says some in Euclidean space. I also look at, can look at the norm and the correlation with the distance to boundaries, uh, but the correlation itself is weaker. I see. But this is then to be so. This is uh, on this map what you see on the on the left image. So on the x-axis mm -hmm. is the the, the the aggregated confidence maps over all the images. On the right is then the uh, the just the just the, the frequency. So this is the core. This is all the let's say the aggregated correlations. Uh, the histogram of that, and most are. Right? It can it can happen. You see some. This part is then negatively correlated, so it's not always positive. But you see the, the biggest bulk is in the oh, positive parts. So from from zero onwards, you go towards a positive uh, correlation. And you can you can you can get positive correlations on aggregate for Euclidean space as well, but it's weaker. I see. Okay. That's what I mean with that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. About your question about how why are these classes not equal and i think you're fully right uh so main yeah which leads to the, the the third paper which is that i always think now about this i have this prior knowledge and then i have hierarchies i can use hyperbolic space and all that all these nice benefits but if i have no knowledge am i just doomed can i just do i also always have to use one hot encoding and i'm done uh i beg to differ uh so the question that we, we're trying to answer here is how do I position classes when I don't have prior knowledge? And for that, I go back. I, I stole this slide from my own uh, machine learning course. So I teach machine learning to data scientists, master students. And I ask them, which of the three lines is best? So which one would you choose? Green. Why green? Right. Why green? Right. We, we know this, right? We, we've been doing this the maximum separation, maximum margins. The, 
this is the oldest inductive bias I can think of for categorization, 40, 50 years old. It goes back to Tom Mitchell himself about inductive biases. So it's a, it's a popular word right now, but I mean, this is like the original inductive bias. And in, in very much in the design of these traditional approaches, right? So SVMs, of course, is in the core. The boosting also tries to look towards the smaller margin, smallest margin. That. So maximum margin, maximum separation has always been a big part of, of machine learning. Uh, and it's also a part of deep learning. So on the left, you see uh, what I, a paper I quite like, which is decoupled networks, which just shows you properties of the classification layer in the, in the convolutional networks, uh, where you can decouple two things, the angle and the norm. So the norm says something about the interclass variation. The angle is used to distinguish classes. So you differentiate classes only based on angles. Now, based on that phenomenon, a lot of papers have then try to improve the separation, make it more uniform or yeah, make it more nice by looking at the angle. So there's a lot of about extra margins in the, in the softmax loss, normalization, et cetera, hyperspherical prototypes I did in, in 2019. Uh, and uh, I'm safe to say that these are wrong, uh, which include myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be nice, but this, this is just, uh, yeah, I think I can partially throw this paper in the, in the trash. Uh, because we, we, we committed a, a, a fatal sin, which is we thought it was an optimization problem. Now, I understand if I look at myself, like to a carpenter, everything is a nail, right? So to us, everything is optimization problem, but uh, that turns out to be wrong. Uh, so what do we want is if I have no prior knowledge, I just want my classes to be far away from each other. I once asked my mom, I gave her an apple and I said, if you have, want to do two classes on this apple, where do you put them? And she, Pointing to both edges, right? Because that's the furthest away they can get. This basic intuition applies here as well. So if I have two classes, right, I have these two red lines mm. on the line. This is the furthest they can they can get from each other. Any direction they will be closer to each other. Now for, for three classes, then I want something like this, right? So I want these nice five angles. And then if I go to four classes, I want something similar where at least all the pairwise angles are always the same. Uh, well, then you can just compute it in closed form. So here is the algorithm, uh, uses a few lines of code and you can just start from two classes in one dimension, then you go to three classes in two dimensions. So this is the operation. So all you need to do is each new class is on the new dimension and the others you first uh, scale in and translate down. Yeah. What, what is the intuition for why this is a closed form solution <laughs> well, this instead of like why, why was optimization on? Like how did you realize, oh, we don't need to optimize, we can just do this? So uh, I think we went too quickly to the solution in the sense, so what we knew from the other papers was that you want, ang you want to maximize the angles between our classes. Oh, nice, maximize, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's a, that sounds like a loss already. Yeah. Uh, so we just make losses out of those. But if you look at what is the minimal loss, mm -hmm. where are they optimal? Well, that's, that is when they are, they are all the angles to each other are the same because then every change will not be more than one. Reminding me a little bit of like chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> when the, the carbon has to be oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So this is actually, this is also not new. This is basically a, for, a form of a regular simplex. So not a normal simplex because that's the, right, the, the, the one, what uh, the basis factors. So this is a regular simplex. Uh, and it's actually also been used in traditional methods. But we, yeah, that was from 10 years ago. So we don't know about these papers. <laughs> These are all forgotten, uh, right? So, but they are of course way more relevant in the deep learning era because that's where we learn. Otherwise you have to adapt your classifier to the fixed features that you have. So they are way more relevant here. So this is a closed form solution. And we show in the paper that indeed it, every new update, all the points are still on this, on the hypersphere equally far away from each other. And what you end up with is I just give it a number of classes. I, I get, end up with a matrix. Now, uh, with matrices, we know what to do. We just plug them in, right? So we can, we, this is a figment. You just have a model, do a matrix multiplication with this fixed matrix, and then do your loss function, your softmax, right? Because now we don't have any prior knowledge, so we use the regular softmax. And that's it. So the main idea is that right now, classification does two things. Separate classes from each other and align images to classes. That's the two things you do. It turns out one of these two things is not implementation problem. So with this approach, we solve one problem and all a deep network needs to do is align an image with 
uh, the fixed class. And that's it. Yeah. So are you suggesting that the maximum of separated vectors are, is, a, is a naturally good basis or a good, good yeah. to, to embed the set? Yes, I, I think that that's a, a natural way of embedding classes. But the matrix multiplication will put it in the in the vector space associated with this, right? They yeah. won't be put, they won't be not necessarily like aligning them with individual directions. Like is there some sort of discrete bottleneck here which asks you to write no. no, no, what I what I think is important here is that they are beyond orthogonal. Oh, okay. Yeah. So right, this is if I look at the, this class upwards, this would be orthogonal, but they are pointing away from each other. So if I do a matrix multiplication, what I want is to point in one direction and away from the others. Uh, and of course, if you then put a softmax behind it, uh, what will happen naturally is that I will make sure my angle, my input is the same as the angle of the, of the class. And by that, I'm already pointing away from the others, right? If I'm on this line of the class, I'm already pointing away from the others. So the softmax will be nice already. And then if actually the further I move up, uh, the more confidence I, I will get. So you still have this extra class variation. Right. So you want you basically what you do is make sure the angle of your your representation of your inputs and the class aligns well, right. and that but that you don't need to do anything with that. You just have a fixed matrix and then the loss will take care of it. Yeah. So one thing that you started with at the beginning of the presentation was talking about how for some of these classes like yeah. the terrier and a bulldog, those should be closer together than like a television. I a yeah. So this now I do the opposite. Yeah. yeah. So this. Kind of pushes all of the classes yeah. equally apart, which you're saying if we have no prior knowledge, what do we do? So that does make sense. But if we have some additional source like that, if we can say, okay, these yeah. classes should be more similar, is it kind of as simple as doing the hierarchical softmax as the loss, or is there something more I, no. intelligent you can do? No, this is these two papers are contradictory in terms of starting points. Right. There's no way to Right. still the hierarchy so, because they're fixed and they're pointing away so right. if they have a hierarchy they're still pointing away not yeah. just right. useless you, you won't have anything closer and to each other. so the question is what do, what am i proposing here hmm. and i'm saying it all depends on your task hmm. so i'm looking here at image nets which i just told you they have these it's not one old yeah. but i'm plugging it in and it improves scores and it's all about the metric so what i care about here is top one and top five accuracy which is one or zero, mm -hmm. right? Which is nothing, there's no semantic consi consistency. There's no zero shot. You're either correct or you're incorrect. And for that specific metric, you just want everything far away from each other. Uh, there are many tasks where this is not the same at all. Think about um, the medical domain. Sure, I can make a small mistake, but saying someone doesn't have cancer who has cancer, that's a, that's a big problem. Yeah. So. Then I have other metrics. I have, there are hierarchical metrics, right? Zero shot metrics, etc. So you, you need to think carefully about which problem are you solving and embed the knowledge of the problem in it. So the first two papers were about the knowledge of the semantics around it. And this is really about the knowledge of the problem. So that's why these the problems we're tackling here are also different from the other papers. The other papers look at hierarchical consistency, zero shots. If I do zero shot with this, I'm 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 doomed. I cannot do anything. But there are other tasks that are really helpful. Like so image nets. If you do image net experiments, you don't you find it hard to beat your competitors. Plug this one matrix in. Your state of the art. I won't tell anyone else. <laughs> Long tailed recognition is also a very popular benchmark. So everyone was at CGPR. Like five ten percent of the papers had something to do with long tailed. Mm -hmm. And long tailed means I have some classes, very few examples, some many along a long tail distribution. And we thought, okay, just we just plug it into a network and see what happens. For example, if the resonant 32 on CFAR, that is, you got already some, some small improvements, just in a completely balanced case. But the more imbalanced it becomes, the bigger the improvement. Basically, for free, there's one fixed matrix, doesn't do anything in practice. We, we didn't measure any difference because it was so quick. So for image classification, yeah, right. So you have like a thousand. Classes. Yes. That means you also have like a thousand vectors in your effort, like Correct. in your yeah. sphere. Yeah. So how do you assign each classes to each? Ah, good point. So I have a thousand classes, but I have I have no knowledge, right? Right. Well, my point is that they are equally far away from each other do in the first place. So do it randomly. 
uh, there because no semantics at all. there's no semantics at all. And the reason is, well, I have a hundred layers before that. Mm. Surely it, it can figure it out. Uh, we, we tried to do some rotating or assignment based on like the initial distribution, yeah, yeah. but it was already completely random. Mm. So if I look, if I just do one four pass of the whole image nest data sets and look at the thousand classes, there's no optimal way to do it a priori. Can there be like some like some discrete optimization such that even though it picked a discrete mind, there's still some semantic? Uh, I so <laughs> that was my intuition. I didn't find it. I okay. I just if I just look at the distributions of all the classes, there's uh -huh. I couldn't assign them such that I already have like a warm start or anything. There was no discernible difference. But that's like a discrete optimization. Okay. Yeah. It yeah. Can solve that. Cool. I can solve that, but it, it didn't yield any benefits. Okay. Um, yeah. Is there some correction you have to do in like certain number of classes because the the, the farthest apart vectors that you have are essentially on the same axis, but they're positive and negatives. So what do you mean? Like for example, if I want to put two classes in the average space of like R3, like yeah. I'll have one vector that points up and the other vector that points down. So that's the same, that, that, that's a collapsed basis, right? Like you don't, you're no longer spanning the whole thing, like basis. Is that a problem? Um, so what we always do is we make sure that the dimensionality of the space is one dimension fewer than the number of classes. I see. So they're not, yeah. they're not free. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think indeed in that case, you might want, if you also want to put other dimensions in there or dummy dimensions or anything like that, you, you might want to do something with those. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we just explicitly say right. there's a fixed number of dimensions, which is one less than the number of classes. Um, and we also thought, oh, we just plug it in to existing methods. Right? I, I just take, this is from CPR last year, long tail paper, plug it in, took it improvements. And uh, my poor PhD student, I, this is what I asked two weeks before the NeurIP deadline. Uh, it's like, okay, just plug it in, right? We need more experiments, we never have enough. And she said, no, I don't want to just plug it in, see what happens. So she, she found where the model, where to plug it in, improve it. So we are by accident also open set state of the arts. Uh, just, just because it was easy to do, for me at least, because I only had to tell her that <laughs> to do so. A bit unfair, but anyway. Um, so maximum separation is old and always been the sign of, of the networks. And in, in deep learning, we try to optimize for that. But there is just a minimal solution, and that is in closed form, easy to compute. Now we we put the archive paper and the the, the code online, so just plug it in if you do a categorization problem, and you'll be helped. Yeah. So why does maximum separation not work in Euclidean space? Uh, so we uh, that's a good question. So why do I use Euclidean space for this? Uh, so hyperbole. yeah, instead of hyperbolic. This is this is Euclidean. That is Euclidean, right? Oh, so oh, this is Euclidean. Yeah. Oh, I see. So we, we the reason we do it including here because we want to focus oh, so on as well like a sphere in the so it, the, oh, the the solution I look at the angle so I'm on the hypersphere but afterwards I do a matrix multiplication right so I basically see. they are just normalized vectors in a Euclidean space mm -hmm. and so there are a number of open questions I can do the same in hyperbolic space yes. maybe there are some benefits I don't know um, but that, that, that yet to be investigated we also try to play around with do we with the norm of these vectors mm -hmm. didn't do anything. Maybe per class you can do the norm with imbalance, but we haven't tried. So like, if you change the norm, yeah, you can do anything at all. No, not really. There, there's a point here. So what? What basically, right? All these vectors are normalized. So norm one, so if I multiply them with a constant, right, and they will become bigger and large, uh, or smaller. Right. And what what it changes is the softmax distribution. These vectors are very big, and very quickly get towards very peak distribution. So there was some benefits. I think smaller is can sometimes be uh, be better but it, yeah so we have it we have it as a hyperparameter but it's not a, yeah we typically just still use one because it's it's, it's it's basically running counter to the temperature term of the soft max yes right? it's very close yeah it's basically the temperature right. yeah so you can also do a temperature and then but that's in the soft max but right. this is uh, yeah 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 i guess it's a similar subject question from before but is there some midway between this and having some sort of bad orange like integrating this framework into so for example like say that you have some sort of simpler model or you learn these representations and now now you have to do it as an optimization problem but then mm. you, you just use this as a final layer like you, you learn this matrix and then so essentially what you're now doing is you're sort of twisting or turning your label space yeah uh, and and trying try to improve training dynamics essentially yeah so the yeah the question is there a best of both worlds yeah i don't know yet and so one intuition i have is you can do this but maybe for subtrees so initially you have like a coarse hierarchy and then for the final, maybe you do on the, like a local level, you do this maximum separation, you get like spheres of influence, but 
I haven't done anything with it yet. So, uh, but yeah, that, that sounds uh, sounds fun. Uh, something in between. So, yeah. so what, what that does make me think of is while you're training a simpler, like some contrastive thing, right? You're basically saying like, which ones are closest compared to the rest of the things in the batch. And the way we usually do that yeah. is with the softmax, you're doing classification and you're saying all the rest of my classes are the other things in the batch. This is the one that is the correct. So class. you're saying that, yeah, so, so there is this paper on the uniformity in alignment, right, it's right. a perspective yeah, on this, yeah, yeah. which is on the hypersphere. Exactly. So what, it's not as easy because I think if you want to do it in, in this, what you need is then your prototypes are on the fly, right? So I have a batch right. and then I have two augmentations of each example. Right. And they basically, those two need to go, and then I have an equal number of classes, which is equal to the number of samples. Right. And I need to then do pairs to classes. But then yeah. I okay. then I need to do what you do, but some discrete optimization to align it Not first. It. And, then and then the next batch you'll need to do. So I think that's that's the next paper. But uh, <laughs> so if you're interested in doing that, I think, the, but you need to do something clever because it's quite slow right. out of the box. You need a very, very fast optimization to make sure they align well and then optimize for this maximum separation. Uh, but I think that yeah. will improve self supervised learning. Yeah. But uh, yeah. there's also the possibility of just doing double work to see if there's a change and like doing like a self, like a supervised context of that. Yeah. yeah, true. You can do it like yeah. a proof of concept. You can also yeah. do the slow way first just to see if it does anything, but same yeah, with supervised just to see. This took a million years to run, but yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's already does something. <laughs> yeah. No, very true. I think that's a very interesting direction because, in a way, self supervised learning is just supervised learning, but we make our own labels. Yeah. So why not separate there? Mm. Uh, so I have uh, I did the thing where I have six conclusion slides. So sorry for that. Um, so first, what have we learned overall? So we learned that hierarchies are everywhere, uh, and hyperbolic geometry is the natural space of hierarchies, and I and also a nice bridge between vision and prior knowledge. So when you don't have any uh, any prior knowledge, you can still do something better than one-hot encodings. I guess I just hate one-hot factors uh, where you do maximum separation. Um, we did a few more papers on this. So this is while I'm here visiting uh, America for a couple of weeks, I have a PhD student slaving away on, on the latest papers. Uh, so we did the nearest paper last year. Did you know that uh, logistic regression is a hyperbolic prototype learner? We found out. So binary logistic regression is a hyperbolic prototype learner if and only if you put the points on the edge of the Poincaré ball and then have something called the Boosman loss instead of a normal distance. So, uh, and then it's the same. Infinite to the actual edge. So the points themselves are infinite with respect to the normal hyperbolic distance, but there's also a, something called a Boosman distance where you can still compute it. So with these two arbitrary choices, binary distribution is a hyperbolic prototype. In multiple, for multiple classes, this, the, the, this relation doesn't automatically hold, but they do something different. And I don't know what this result means yet. Uh, but yeah, the, it's, there are some really more intrinsic relations between hyperbolic space and, and machine learning. Mm -hmm. They're not just a choice, but they seem to be uh, quite connected. Uh, but that's, that's, we don't know anything beyond that. And we also have like uh, on, more on the hypersphere. This is, I think, paper that is a bit too early. Uh, my mistake, there are now all these large scale models where I train on huge amount of data and then I can generalize to new classes. Well, if you do so, there are still biases. Uh, so you can improve those biases by looking it from a transductive point of view. So I take a look at my whole data set and I know which classes are over the whole data set. So if I have my prototypes for these classes and I have all the test videos, I can do optimal transport to align them better. That we did it for actions and it, it improved massively, but it's not work. Um, and I was going to highlight a few others. There are many, many more. I just highlight only a few uh, of different directions, right? There's one. Oh, this is uh, this one is, uh, should be familiar yeah. bottom left right which is very much also about this uncertainty hyperbolic space and how useful it is so very interesting perspective anything from hyperbolic prototypes hyperbolic vision transformers of, of course uh, the cvpr unsupervised hyperbolic learning but in a hierarchical manner uh, hyperbolic object detection well there's there's a hammer flowing now so if you also have a problem that has hierarchies let me know uh, i have a hammer um, you can write a new paper <laughs> Uh, and beyond vision, it, 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 right? there's, there's many more things to be done. Uh, graphs, cells, text, anything is being made hyperbolic now. Some uh, fields are much further. So this is what you described. This is the tw 2019, what I did in 2019. Project Euclidean, Euclidean uh, uh, neighborhood aggregation and, and updating. 
back to hyperbolic space. Last year there was a, a few papers and this year as well that directly in this ball model, or there are a few other models like the Lorentz model, directly on that do these graph operations. So the very last conclusion slide is uh, we're only getting started, right? One common question is we only do the very last layer hyperbolic. Can we make the whole network hyperbolic? Well, that turns out to be a monster of a problem because you need hyperbolic convolutions, not approximate, but full, fully hyperbolic. Hyperbolic residuals, hyperbolic pooling, hyperbolic batch norm. That's horrible because the mean is hard to compute, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these layers you have to make, optimize, and then make competitive with the normal networks, which is basically a million people working on for ten years, right? That's that's what ResNet is right now. All these optimization tricks. So we're, we're working on that. Well, that's a big problem, uh, but that with potentially a big outcome, right? If you make the whole network hyperbolic, it says something completely about visual learning because even something as an edge filter is now in a different geometry. What does it mean? Is it better? Yeah. Don't know, but I'm eager to find out. But you also need your input to be the- Yeah, but so you're right, the input needs to be hyperbolic. Yeah. Did you know that if I just look at raw colors, mm -hmm. so the wavelengths and I just discrete, make them discrete and sort them, that's hyperbolic. This is an old, old no, archaic knowledge from color theory. Yeah. RGB is linear, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I have to do this exponential mapping. Right. But if I look at so some problems, like we really need precise color information, mm -hmm. that is already in hyperbolic space. Just Sorry? What is the no, no, really, if I take the whole wavelength spectrum and I just make it discrete, oh, okay. so I really store like a hundred dimensional color, the color spectrum, uh, for example. I think uh, CI lab also has hyperbolic properties. I don't think it is, maybe, but I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. So CI lab does have hyperbolic, does do something hyperbolic rather than, but there are RGB Euclidean, so you need to do this mapping first. Uh, but that's a small part. So in, in the, uh, right, there are many more knowledge sources that we haven't looked at. Temporal, uh, spatial hierarchies, right? Uh, different domains, like in the medical domain, where you always have limited examples, but books full of prior knowledge. Uh, what about multiple modalities? Right? Computer vision is basically a multimodal conference right now. There are all sorts of modalities and hierarchies within modalities. And lastly, right, coming back to the, this third part, now we're looking at the curvature of, of classification spaces, but I really care about the curvature also of representation learning in vision. And what does it mean? There are even some people in neuroscience that claim that something like V1 the edges are not Euclidean, but hyperbolic. Of course, they have no quantitative proof of that, uh, but I would like to supply that proof. Uh, but give me a year, maybe I'll come back next year and I'll talk about this or just say this was a lost endeavor, uh, but we don't know it. And with that, I think my time is up. So uh, thank you a lot. Any questions you still have? Yeah, I guess one more general sort of question is, uh, what is your perspective on sort of the pathway to learning in more arbitrary geometries rather than ones which have like constant curvature? Like um, so I think what we want is uh, a general network where the curvature is learned. And I can even learn my curvature such that it's actually Euclidean. So, if I can, so that's what I, what I want to go towards, where I just say we don't choose between yeah. uh, geometries, but we just say it's part of the network. Uh, there's also something called product manifolds where you actually have both explicitly in there and then you can decide, oh, do I want to be more in this part of the surface or this part? That's another way of doing so. But I want to focus on learning curvature. There are some papers on generating curvature in few shot learning in computer vision. Okay. That's already some attempt at it, okay. but I want the whole network uh, and then fully learnable curvature per layer. Because like right now it feels like when you move to a new geometry, even if it's slightly different, you have to sort of go through the whole process of recomputing what condition means in this geometry and so yeah. on and so forth. So um, is the is the solution to moving to general curvature like having approximation with geodesic distances or something like that? Something you can I, I think sort so. of like close yeah. solution. <laughs> Note that if I take I, I start from the hyperbolic geometry and then go towards zero curvature, yeah. I end up with something that's equivalent to, to Euclidean. Yeah. So from hyperbolic to Euclidean is possible for Euclidean to hyperbolic not. So I think by going to hyperbolic and then making it learnable, there's always a path towards. But the problem is of course, that's, that's close to, but 
then the optimization part of it, the actual numerical part of it is not, right? There's still these, these clunky, uh, messy, big 10H, uh, right? The hyperbolic functions all around that make it very slow. So that's all me talking in theory. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, in theory, yes. In practice, uh, you still have a lot of numerical problems that you need to solve. Yeah. That's a very related thing. What do you think the, the main obstacles or limitations to this area really like hitting the big time are? Is it these optimizers being so slow? Is it like that you have to do all this like geometry specific implementation or stuff? So let's say on the short term, it's the last thing you said for all the layers optimizing that and making everything fast. It's just, it's just an, like a big engineering problem. Yeah. It was the same for Euclidean, by the way, e even though we still had something easier, just matrix multiplications you can do with the GPU. Yeah. Um, but that still took many years, right? I remember the, the old Cafe Tiano times. So it was a very different era from now, right? This is, uh, that, that, so it, it's already for you think it, it progressed a lot. And so now we need to do catch up with a whole new geometry. But that's on the short term. On the long term is we have no clue what this means. Is this in 10 years, do we all teach any, everyone about uh, hyperbolic geometry because that's the basis or is it just some niche thing that yeah, just occupies my time and then I'm, I'm somewhere on the border rambling away about hyperbolic space and the rest is just no, let, let the old guy talk. I don't know, that could be, maybe it's probably somewhere in the middle. I hope for the other opposite, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I could be, I could end up just uh, rambling away about it. So that, the, the main thing is we have no clue what, what will happen if we do all of this and it's fast and it's good and we can learn the curvatures and all everything, but it could just be the same but worse or the same even does even even in a way even more more bad is the same yeah that should be boring uh, but yeah that, that's the, that's the fun part of research so rather than having a paper where you don't know I just I try to do a whole subfield where you don't know anything. <laughs> any other questions any questions on uh, Zoom? Uh, Pascal I had a question on the uncertainty and we yeah. were wondering about this ourselves is do you have any I, do you have any ideas on how to convert kind of that the uh, the, the radius there to kind of a traditional pr probability? Um, ah. Is there any way to map map between the two? Uh, we were debating. We never could answer this question. I was curious if you had any any in, in, insight on this. <laughs> yeah. So um, we we did similar to you in the sense we obviously it's all relative, uh, and then it's okay. Uh, really, statistics or probability theory in hyperbolic space. There's not a lot out there which makes sense because there's already not a lot on numerical stuff on hyperbolic space. And the ones that came are from physicists that just try to have vector operations in 3D space in space time, because that's where you are with in relativity or in basically hyperbolic space in, uh, in space time. But there's a very limited background. Uh, and then, uh, so there is one or, uh, so one or two books on, on probability theory for hyperbolic space, but even that didn't provide all the answers. So I hired a mathematician recently uh, working on hyperbolic space for computer vision. Uh, and he already, uh, well, he, he started not so long ago. He talked about what he really wants to do is also a full theory of statistics and the probability theory in hyperbolic space. But that's, I, I told them uh, to slow down and first write a paper. <laughs> uh, but, but you're totally right. There's, no, there's not a lot out there. There's not a lot on the, off the shelf that we can use. There's, there's So there's yeah. some, points out there, but I couldn't tell you here, this is the library to use for the paper to use. So we, we stumbled upon a similar problem. Okay, yeah, that's good, good, good to know. <laughs> no, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah. Any other? Yeah, I think most of the questions have probably come up. Yeah, <laughs> very so, true. <laughs> uh, but all right, let's thank the speaker. Um, thank, thank you so very much. much. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, thanks everyone at home for, for being here. Thank you. Bye-bye.